I want to start with a rather intriguing scenario that, that played itself out in um, New Jersey at the Central Railway Station. At the, at the central, I don't want to use the hand microphone, but uh, I'll speak louder. Um, at, the, at the Central Railway Station in New Jersey, at 10 o'clock on a November evening, um, and there was one, one train that was preparing to depart for the south, heading in the direction of Georgia, but not going all the way to Georgia. This was a, a train of the usual kind. It was a steam engine with, with uh, the usual assortment of nondescript carriages attached to it. The, uh, the, 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 the lowest class of carriage was directly behind the steam engine because that was the one that collected all the soot and the, and the smoke. Further back, you, you found the more prestigious coaches, but they weren't particularly prestigious by any standards at all. But separately from, from the train stood a very splendid carriage, resplendent in its, in its uh, glorious color black, and quite obviously of a different shape and of a different uh, purpose. And this was a carriage that belonged to one Senator Nelson Aldridge, a multimillionaire and also an investment associate of J.P. Morgan. This was the carriage that was due to convey the notables who were invited to, to, uh, to attend a particular event um, uh, just off the coast of, of Georgia, but none of them were informed at the time what the purpose of the, of the trip would be. And in fact, ostensibly the purpose of the trip was to go bird hunting, to go duck hunting, just off the coast, off the coast of, of, of Brunswick. The other six uh, passengers on this train, on this, on this carriage, were Henry Davidson, who was a senior partner of J.P. Morgan. You'll notice the name crops up from time to time. Charles Norton, who was the president of the First National Bank of New York, bankers it seems. A. Piat Andrew, the assistant secretary of the treasury. Frank van der Lipp, the president of the National City Bank of New York, and also representing William Rockefeller. Paul War Warburg from Hamburg. Now, Warburg is an interesting character because he was, he was a German national and then emigrated to the United States, um, having inherited the, the Warburg banking empire of, of Hamburg and of Amsterdam. And uh, he then bought, when he arrived as, a, as an immigrant to the United States, he bought a... Um, a share in a business called Kuhn, Lube and Associates, which was also a banking enterprise. But the thing about Warburg was that he, was, he had been funded by both the Rothschilds in Europe and by the Warburg family itself. And eventually he became one of the wealthiest people in all of America. His real purpose in life was to bring about a central bank. And that is what he managed to accomplish. The other notable on the train was an individual by the name of Benjamin Strong. Now, some of you may have heard the name. He was the head of J.P. Morgan Bankers Trust. He also eventually became the, uh, the governor of the uh, Federal Reserve of New York. But he's particularly well known for his somewhat infamous comment that as governor of the Federal Reserve of New York, he was going to administer a coup de whiskey to the stock exchange. Now, we know now from history what happened as a result of the coup de whiskey. He did administer the coup de whiskey in the form of, of uh, cheap lending rates, uh, low, low interest rates. And this did encourage a speculative frenzy on the stock exchange, which led, if not directly, then certainly indirectly, to the crash of 1929. So the stock exchange was indeed affected by the coup de whiskey. In fact, it became so intoxicated that it couldn't stand upright any longer. Now, the question is, what, what, what was the objective? Well, the objective was, first of all, a geographic one. They were making their way to a little village by the name of Brunswick, off the coast of Georgia, which is where they eventually decamped. And uh, from the fishing village, they were taken by motor launch to an island with a rather unusual name and somewhat sinister name of Jekyll Island. Jekyll Island was, in fact, the private retreat of J.P. Morgan himself 
and of a few of his multimillionaire friends and colleagues, bankers mostly. And they decamped to, to this island, which is where they spent the next several days. Some of the guests on the train did in fact carry with them their rifle carry, uh, c c cases. And that created the impression that, in fact, there was going to be a hunting expedition. But it's doubtful whether those were ever used. In fact, what the purpose of the, of the expedition was, was to discuss and to bring about the creation of a central bank. America had experimented with central banks on three previous occasions. But because of the somewhat rigorous, independent and republican spirit of the Americans, which was then, then still alive, the uh, three attempts had all failed for various reasons. And there was an innate, an innate hostility to the idea of a central bank, partly because it was an offshoot of the kind of thing that happened in the colonial times when, when America was a reluctant colony of, of Britain, partly because it was seen to be an imposition upon the independent spirit of the Republicans. So the conspirators at Jekyll Island understood very well that they had quite an obstacle to overcome. There's an obstacle of the innate spirit of the American uh, people, the spirit of independence. But they were an influential bunch and they were very, very determined. Now, what was it with the, that they were attempting to establish? We say, I say a central bank, but in fact it was nothing other than a cartel, a banking cartel. And one would say, well, what, what was the advantage? Well, I suppose a cartel always has its own inherent advantages for the conspirators. But there was an ostensible reason which would give some legitimacy to the project. The ostensible reason was at the time there were some 20,000 banks, independent banks in the United States. And during the course of the previous couple of years, before this, this meeting occurred in 1910, the uh, 20,000 or the, the, bank, the number of banks had grown to 20,000 from 10 or 12,000. So it increased almost, almost doubled. This had created a risk, a variety of different risks, but I suppose the most obvious risk was the risk of bank failure. And bank failure occurs most frequently because of a run of the bank. <coughs> now, in order to understand how that comes about, I must just say a word or two about the banking system. The important thing to realize, and of course, I suppose one would be a little bit skeptical in thinking that there could have been 20,000 banks, even in a country as, as vast as the United States. But uh, if one was to say, well, uh, the banking system, a bank is nothing more than a glorified pawnbroker, then it's not that hard to conceive of 20,000 pawnbrokers in the United States, in various villages and towns and, and hamlets. And these would then set themselves up with a spirit of, of freedom and independence as bankers. The activity would be essentially the same. So these 20,000 pawnbrokers represented a challenge and they represented a, a significant and growing challenge to the, to the big bankers of, of New York. Now, the question then is, how do banks make their profit? There are a variety of different ways, but there are two essential ways. The first method is that they take money in by way of deposit, and pay a certain rate of interest, a fairly low, sometimes even a nominal rate of interest of maybe two or three percent for, for, for borrowing the money from the public. And then they lend out that money at a higher rate of interest to those who want to borrow the money from the bank. And the difference between the two rates is called the spread. And that spread represents not only the, 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 the cost of running the bank, but also, of course, the, uh, the profit for the, for the bankers themselves. That is the, the one most obvious method by which bankers make a profit. The less obvious method, and perhaps the less well-known method, is what is known as uh, fractional reserve banking. Now, fractional reserve banking sounds more complex than it actually is. It, it really amounts to no more than this, that um, 
the, the banker takes in a certain amount by way of deposits, let's say a million dollars. In the process of lending out the money that has been taken in by way of deposit, the banker is not restricted only to the million dollars that has been taken in, but lends out a multiple of that amount and keeps only a small proportion in reserve. And it was quite common then and still is today that the banker would, would lend out 10 times the amount that has been taken, uh, taken in by way of deposit. Now, the, the reserve, the amount that is kept in reserve, is, is, is the safety valve. If, for instance, 10% is kept as a safety valve, then that is thought to be a reasonably prudent type of safety valve. But it can easily come unstuck, as you can imagine. In those days, with the 20,000 banks in existence, if any one of those banks should start to suffer from a rumor, and the rumor mill was, was very active, as you can imagine, a rumor that the bank doesn't have our money, then, of course, the run on the bank starts. And as a result of the run on the bank, the, the bank becomes insolvent. It is unable to meet its obligation. Because you only require 11% of the depositors to come and ask for their money, money back, and the, the, the bank can't pay. It's not, not able to, to, to make the payments. So that would give rise, and it did give rise from time to time, to bank failures. And those bank failures were, had become a big political issue in the United States. The bank failures were a matter of concern to the politicians and also to the public. And what the conspirators thought they would do, and in fact what they did very successfully too, was to exploit that sense of uncertainty and unease. And they said, well, we are going to establish a central bank which will impose discipline upon the banking industry. And the discipline that we will impose will be twofold. First is that we will regulate the rate of interest that, that, they, ch that they pay for the deposit. So, the, so the, the, the banking industry is not as cutthroat as it has been to date. And the second thing that we will do is to insist upon a certain minimum reserve. The reserve at the time might have been 10% or 5% of the money taken in, but it was to become a, 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 a mandatory standard for the entire banking industry. And they, because they were to be essentially a government-sponsored enterprise, although independent, but, but they would have statutory authority, and that was, that was the intention. It was rather like the, the charter companies of the 17th and 18th century. So with the authority of, or the backing of uh, uh, statutory authority, they would impose their requirements upon the, the entire industry. And in imposing the requirements on the industry, the industry would become subservient to the cartel. That, in effect, is what happened. So, the result of all of this was that it was dressed up as a public service, but nevertheless had the intention of operating as a cartel. And the cartel operated for the benefit of the conspirators themselves. That was the purpose. And if they were able to destroy much of the banking industry, so much the better, because there'd be less competition. Now, it's intriguing when one thinks about how the history of economics has developed, um, to think of the, 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 the two essential streams of discipline that have taken place over the years. And I'm inclined, as a result of my own volition, to divide the streams into, into two. The, the, the one is what I call the age of instruction. And instruction in this, in this situation is not intended to be um, giving instruction in the sense of, of informing people, but instruction in the sense of being prescriptive. Now, the age of instruction is something with which we live at the moment. I'm not sure where it started. It may well have started as a result of the French Revolution, which is often, has often been the case in history, that various movements started as a result of an offshoot of, of the result of the French Revolution. It may be that um, an individual with the authority of um, Maximilian Robespierre um, enabled the 
instruction to take place because he was an instructor. He started his, his political life as, as a liberal, I suppose. One would call him a liberal. He was in favor of, of freedom of the individual. He was very much in favor of free press, free, free opinions. And he wasn't even anti-monarchist. Um, he just believed that the monarchy should be brought under control. But when the revolution succeeded, he became a Jacobin, and he was instrumental in bringing about the reign of terror. Now, the reign of terror was instituted by and on the instruction of, of Robespierre in order to, to create a nation of virtuous people in France. That was, that was his purpose. But in setting about this task, he then uh, released and brought about the reign of terror. And the reign of terror was, as we very well know, a, 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 a terrible experience for all of the people who were afflicted by it. And it is interesting to see how this kind of phenomenon has recurred over the years, over the hundreds of years since then. Because in a way, this age of instruction, which might have been initiated by Robespierre, was certainly continued by someone like Karl Marx. Karl Marx also was a world improver. His concern also was ostensibly with, with, the, with the common man and how best to, 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 to attend to the interests of the common man. But in fact, we know exactly how it turned out. It turned out in the opposite way. Now, today, we have, I suppose, the, the strangest and, and most insidious manifestation of the age of instruction. And that is the age of political correctness and intolerance. Intolerance of other people's opinions intolerance of the views of others, intolerance of the attitudes of others, and an instruction on how to behave, an instruction on how all of one's aspects of life should, should, be, should be conducted in accordance with a, a predetermined set of rules. And those rules, of course, are the rules of political correctness. Now, I will revert to this because it becomes quite important for the purpose of the further development of my thesis. But the age of instruction must be contrasted with what I would call the previous age of inquiry. And that was an age in which intellectuals were sought to find the truth. They looked at nature, they looked at human nature, they looked at the circumstances about them, they looked at the need for the ordinary individual to have a, a, a religious or a faith-based lifestyle. And all of these things gave rise to a, 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 a a body of information which eventually became what one would call the wisdom of the West. The philosophers were part of it, and certainly the, 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 the churches played a significant role. After the Dark Ages, when nothing really of any significance happened, the age of instruction was sorry, the age of inquiry was, was reinvigorated by a group of people called the Scholastics. Now, the, the Scholastics were essentially an offshoot of, of the monastic uh, environment. The churches had, had survived the, 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 the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, and um, had now again started a process of inquiry. The scholastics were a, 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 a diverse group, and they were from various churches, various Catholic churches around Europe, but they all had one central objective, and that was to determine what the truth was, to determine what, what their inquiry, how, cl how close the inquiry could lead them to an understanding of man's place on earth. These scholastics uh, were also influenced at the time by quite an interesting phenomenon, and that was the growth of the merchant class. The merchant class um, had also come about more or less simultaneously as, as a result of the outgrowth of the Dark Ages and the reaction against it. And they then started to, to, to make inquiries into the way in which merchants could most profitably operate their business and why they were motivated, what they were motivated by. That motivation was, was, a, was a, a serious consideration for the scholastics because they saw it, said to themselves, well, here are these people, there seem to be an itinerant group of individuals 
whose real purpose is to, is to trade. And, and the purpose is fulfilled in trading at a profit. So the, the profit motive was an important consideration. And, and the scholastics looked at this and they said, well, what is profit? And they didn't call it the word by the name profit, they called it by the name value. How, do, how is value established? Well, they looked about them and they said, well, maybe value is what, what the merchant requires for his goods. And then other scholastics said, no, that can't be, because if, if the value is determined only by the merchant, then of course uh, the merchant would ask an outrageous price for his goods and, uh, and he, would, he would impoverish the, the consumer. As a reaction against that proposal came the opposite proposal, which is we must look at what the consumer is prepared to pay. And others said, well, no, that can't be, because the consumer obviously wants to pay as little as possible. And in seeking to pay as little as possible, he will drive the merchant out of business. And so the, the debate went on, probably went on for, for quite a considerable period of time. And then eventually someone came up with the idea of utility. We heard that word repeated a number of times yesterday. And uh, the utility of, of an object in, in this environment, in this, in this, against this background, was to be determined by virtue of the usefulness that the object would have for the consumer. That idea gained currency for a while until somebody said, one of the other scholastics said, no, that can't be. Because uh, let's compare the price of a loaf of bread with a pearl. A loaf of bread has far more utility than a pearl, uh, but a pearl is vastly more valuable than a loaf of bread. So the theory of utility doesn't work either. So having gone through this, this process, and I, I, I belabor the, the, the process itself in order to show how important this kind of inquiry was to these people. They, they, they went through a process of, of thinking things out. And eventually, someone looked back at history, at ancient history, and they discovered Aristotle. And it was discovered that Aristotle had, in his time, come upon a rudimentary principle of demand and supply. Aristotle had said that the value of a product is determined in the marketplace, is determined by looking on the one hand at the uh, demand that there is for a product, and on the other hand by looking at how many of those items of, of, of goods are available in the market. And, and the two prices, to the, to the two items will determine the <laughs> ultimate value. So the scholastics looked at this and studied it as they were wont to do, and they concluded that the law of supply and demand was the appropriate way in which to, to, to determine this matter. So now I'm talking about a law which has survived for centuries and centuries and was devised by this essentially religious group in the year 1200. It's, it's, a, it's an 800-year-old rule, and, and that rule has, has survived to this day. In the most sophisticated books on economics, well, well, one will encounter the same principle, and it is looked at in, in detail, in excruciating detail, taught it at universities, and has survived all of the assaults that were apparently made against, against the principle. The scholastics pointed the way, I suppose, to subsequent forms of analysis by various economists. And I, I don't want to go into to too much of the history, but there are some names that are worth mentioning. There were the Frenchmen, centuries later, Frederick Bastiat and Jean Baptiste Say. Say is very interesting because um, he devised what was called Say's Law. Say's Law says essentially that the production of a, of a society um, will determine the, 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 the consumption. So he puts production first and he says, we produce first and, and then the society is able to consume. This principle has been somewhat corrupted by people who are, I suppose have an ulterior motive to say production causes consumption. Well, that's an oversimplification. In a, in a broad sense, that is probably what Say was saying. 
But the real principle is that uh, production is the enabler of consumption. It enables the society to consume. And the reason why it enables the society to consume is not only because the goods are produced, but also and more particularly because in the process of producing the goods, people are employed, they are gainfully employed, and then you have the multiplier effect. For every one person who is employed, other people become employed in related industries. And that's, that's how the economy operates. So Say was undou undoubtedly correct in having postulated this, 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 this rule. Then we have the liberal philosophers, I suppose one would call them the moral philosophers, uh, John Locke and John Stuart Mill, who also made their contribution in a very significant way to, to economic thought. Adam Smith, I need hardly tell you about him, and the enduring quality of his, uh, his invisible hand. The principle of the invisible hand also has, has never been disproven and, and seems to me to be proven over and over again. And then we've got from that the Austrian school, Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich von Hayek. Now von Mises wrote a book, an 880 page book called Human Action. And it is the title of this book that, that I find especially intriguing, apart from the content, which of course is, is, is quite formidable, but, but very digestible. There's nothing, nothing obscure about any of the things that he, that he puts forward. But human action means that we look to human beings, to how they interact with each other, how they relate to each other, what their values are relative to, to, to one another, and how they add value to the society collectively. And all of this comes about, says uh, von Mises, as a result of human action, as a result of the innate nature of the human being. So that is his essential thesis. And again, I think incontrovertible. Joseph Schumpeter, I mentioned him yesterday, very important economist, who was very prescient. And he said, well, democracy will inevitably lead eventually to the self-serving nature of human beings, lead, uh, want, wanting a process of socialism. The politicians will want it because that ensures their re-election, uh, because the, the majority of people will, will be inclined to the socialistic philosophy, and the, the, the majority of people uh, will want it because it is to their benefit. They can live at other people's expense. So these are the people who I think mapped out the thinking, this, this moral philosophy and the thinking, the economic thinking of, uh, of the 19th and 20th century. But then came a man with a mission, and he is an individual who f falls into the former ca category, John Maynard Keynes. Keynes was not even an economist, he was, he was a mathematician. But he w did have a mission, and he was an instructor. He wasn't an inquirer, like the others I've just mentioned, he was an instructor. And his instruction ultimately gave rise, I th believe, to, to, to one of the most harmful economic theories that the world has ever seen, and one that we still live with, with the consequences of which we still live with today, and which will escalate in the, with the passage of time. Keynes has had, I suppose, essentially a, a non-conformist lifestyle, which one would find unacceptable, but his lifestyle, in a way, directed his, his philosophy, his thinking. He was a member of, the, uh, of what was called the, um, uh, the Bloomsbury set in London, and they are well known, were well known as, as, as being conspicuous nonconformists, and he was himself a conspicuous nonconformist. Nothing wrong with that. But there were two things about which he, he railed on, and the one was what he called the, uh, the Judeo-Christian ethic of saving, which he thought was a malicious and, and destructive ethic. He was obviously not, not religious in any sense at all. But he did have a faith, a belief, in maintaining a, a kind of system which would be most beneficial to people of, of his ilk. Consumption was what he was all about. And so he challenged Say's law. He said, Say is wrong. Production is not the, the, the source of consumption. It's the other way around. Consumption is the source of production. Now, this was 
wonderful news for the, for the conspirators of Jekyll, Jekyll Island because it meant that if, if such a philosophy could be adopted, sort of universally adopted, as indeed it has been, then the result would be that there would be an increasing demand for debt. Debt would be an inevitable consequence of, of Keynes's theory. Because if you say consumption comes first, we must look after the consumer, we must provide for the consumer, and production will then take care of itself. You put the cart before the horse. Then, in effect, the only way in which that can be brought about in practice is if there's going to be an explosion of debt. Debt is the method by which you can, you, you, you can actually bring about Keynes's idea of, of consumption before production. And that's exactly what happened. So the conspirators of, of Jekyll Island managed in, two, in 1913 to, to, to have the, um, the, the central bank created and they were smart enough to realize that the word bank was to be left off the descriptor of this, of this organization. And to this day, you will have noticed that the American Central Bank is not called a bank. It's not referred to as the Federal Reserve Bank. It's called the Federal Reserve. And that's it. That's it. Another deception on the part of the conspirators. They were determined to hide their real purpose. And also, the, the, the bank was to be given a stamp of, of government approval. It was to become a statutory organization, although, although independent. And I mean, it, 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 even to this day, they emphasize the so-called independence of the bank, which is very doubtful. But it, it was there in order to take care of the interests of the big banking and empire, empires of, of New York. That was the, that was the principal re the reason. Now, the result of all of this the passage of time has been, as I say, the explosion of debt. And we know, because the statistics are published now, that at the moment the, United, the, the national debt of the United States is $21.5 trillion. Trillion, that is. Now, for those who are not accustomed to such large figures, and I confess that I, I have some difficulty at times thinking about them, a trillion is a thousand billion. A billion is a thousand million. So a trillion is a million million. 21 trillion is 21 million million. I mean, it's, it's, it's an incomprehensible figure. And there have been a few illustrations of, of, of what this would look like if you, if you piled $100 bills one on top of another. Crisp, brand new do dollar bills, not, not the, 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 the crinkled ones. The, the skyscraper would, would reach all the way from New York to the moon and back a few times over. And that would only be one trillion. That would be just one trillion. So 21 trillion is, is an amount of money that cannot conceivably ever be paid. America is essentially insolvent. It's an insolvent country. And the reason why it has become insolvent is because of Keynes's idea, because of the adoption of the idea that, that consumption comes first and that consumption comes at the expense, in a way, of production. America has become a non-productive country. Poor old Donald Trump, I mean, in all his vain attempts at putting things right, so saying he's going to make America great again, by reintroducing production into the United States. I think it's a vain hope. It's not something that's likely to happen. Because consumption has become part of the American way of life. The Americans are a nation of consumers, not producers. And, and that, that is essentially the result of, jo of, of, John, of, uh, of John Maynard Keynes's philosophy. And it comes from the, the two issues that I've raised. Say was wrong, he says, and we must get away from the Judeo-Christian ethic of, of saving. Saving is a, is a morbid preoccupation with the, with the future, said he. So the result is there now for all to see. But now there was another complication because it was perceived that if one is going to put consumption first and production only as a consequence, and if the consumption was to be funded by way of debt um, and the debt would come about as a result of the issuance of, of a lot of credit from the banks. So there'd be a big demand, an increasing demand for credit and there would be more money in circulation. The almost inevitable consequence of all of this would be an increased rate of inflation. Well, 
there was a very interesting way in which they, uh, the apologists dealt with this issue. They said, well, no matter, because inflation is good. We've heard that. We hear it to this day, that economists and bankers in particular, central bankers more than anyone, will make the excuse that inflation is necessary for growth. Well, it is arrant nonsense. By, by virtue of what logic is, does inflation, does the growth of the economy depend upon um, an inflation rate of 25 or 3 percent? They do concede that you can have too high a rate of inflation, but the important thing is that they say we must have inflation in order to, to ensure growth in the economy. Well, that proposition has been disproven by actual experience in the United States. In the 40 years, now this calculation has been done because the statistics have become available. In the 40 years preceding the establishment of the Federal Reserve in 1913, the United States had no inflation at all. In fact, from year to year, there was a very mild deflation. Now that, that we are told nowadays is the worst possible outcome because deflation means that the, co that the country goes into recession and, and, and recession can actually even lead to a depression. So that, that, that is the doomsday scenario that we're told of now. But throughout those 40 years, there was a very mild form of deflation, which meant that in 1913, the dollar earned in, 19, in 1877 was worth more than it was at the time when the Federal Reserve was, was established. But not only that, there's another very interesting statistic, and that is that in that period of time, the economy, the American economy, grew at an average rate of 4% per annum. Now, if only we in South Africa could experience a growth rate of 4% per annum. And if we could experience it while having a deflation rate of 1%, well, that, that would be the best of both worlds. But that's not what, what the central bank, what the Federal Reserve brought about. They brought about the exact opposite. The ostensible reason was that the Federal Reserve was created in order to, to stabilize the value of the dollar. That was, that was one of the official reasons given out. Stabilize the value and to maintain the value of the dollar. Well, what does history tell us? In all the years in which the Federal Reserve has been in operation, the value of the dollar has decreased by 97%. So much for, their, for, their, for the reason for their existence. The dollar has, has decreased by 97, it's become practically worthless in comparison with what it was at the end of that period of mild deflation when you had growth at 4% at per annum. So it gives the lie to, to all of Keynes's theory, and I, I think he was a scoundrel, and, and those who continue to perceive him as, as, as being the saviour of the, of, of the monetary system of the world, I think have got it entirely wrong. He, he facilitated the, the banking cartel, which is the Federal Reserve, and I deal especially with the Federal Reserve because it is the most obvious example of the way in which central banks can go wrong. I'm not saying it's the only, only miscreant. I think they're all miscreants, quite frankly. But the Central Bank of, New York, of, of America, the Federal Reserve, is the worst of them all. And of course it is also, as it happens, the one that is most influential. Because whenever the so-called monetary committee of the, Central, of the Federal Reserve gets together to decide what the rate of interest should be, the whole world holds its breath. And, and we stand, we in South Africa and people in, in, in China and, and in Japan and, and in Europe hold their breath collectively and they say, well, what is, the, what is the Fed going to do? We've heard that expression over and over. What are they going to do? Well, why on earth should that be the case? If one thinks about it, the, the rate of interest is the price of money. It's a price. And you think to yourself, well, the free marketeers of the world have in the past said, during the course of the Cold War, well, how can the Russians, the Politburo, decide that their agricultural committee can, can determine the, the price of potatoes or wheat or how, how, much, how, much, uh, how many tractors are to be built? How can that be determined by a central committee? Well, they were right about that, of course. It can't be determined by a central committee. But interest, which is the most important price that you can think of in any economy, is determined all the time by a central committee. And that is the central bank, the Federal Reserve. They determine it, a committee determines. This is a price that should be determined in the marketplace, as every free marketeer would appreciate. But it's not the case. 
It's determined by a Politburo, by, by, by a banking Politburo. And that's what the, the, the Federal Reserve is. Now, the result of this is that there has been inflation, even though we, we are told that inflation is very mild and lower than it should be in the United States. But the official, on the one hand, the official figures for inflation are, are understated and always are and have been, especially in the last 20 years. They have, they have policies whereby they say, well, we, we, will, we will understate and, and they, they, they tell the public beforehand how, how they formulate the basket of, of items that, that are taken into account. Uh, they've got a variety of different ways, tricks that they use, and, and I, I don't want to go into the detail because I see I'm running out of time. But uh, those, those devices inevitably understate the rate of inflation. And we in South Africa also appreciate that when, when, the, when we are informed that the rate of inflation is, is under the 6% margin, that that's nonsense. Every housewife would know that that is, that is simply not the case. Every driver of a motor vehicle who has to put in fuel at an ever-increased price knows that that is a nonsensical. And every buyer of any commodity which is dependent upon transport and, and food and the like will know that those figures are nonsensical. But in fact, there is just a grain of truth in the American suggestion, the economist suggestion in America, that, that inflation rate is under control. Well, it is, it is apparently under control. And even if one disbelieves the 2.5% rate of inflation, which is officially published, and you substitute that with 55 or 6%, which is perhaps closer to, to reality, that is not telling the whole story, because the inflation that, that has occurred in the United States as a result of two combined forces, the one, the intellectual force of John Maynard Keynes and, and the effect that he has had on the economy, and the other, the, the monetary, uh, uh, monetary effect of the Federal Reserve in determining the rate of, of, of interest, which they've always held to be, or at least for the last 30 years, much lower than it should be, uh, and the result has been that a, a great explosion in debt has taken place. And because of this explosion in, de in debt, the money has gone somewhere. Now the question is, where has it gone? If it hasn't gone to consumer goods, if it hasn't gone into that basket of products that, that are counted by, by the, the, the statisticians in order to determine the rate of inflation, where has it gone? Well, it's gone into assets. It's gone into the stock exchange. It's gone into the skyscrapers of Manhattan. That's where it's gone. It's gone into the, into the mansions of, of, of the Hamptons. All of those billionaire establishments have, have, have profited gloriously as a result of this generous policy of the Federal Reserve. But it's been done at the expense of the middle class. In America, I mean, we know that various uh, uh, reports have been, have been issued which, which have paint a fairly optimistic view of the growing middle class around the world. Well, I'm not disputing that. I'm, I'm sure that that's, that's, that's true. But the middle class in America, in the United States, which at one stage was the predominant element of that society, has shrunk. It has shrunk significantly over the last 50 years. And there are statistics that have been published that demonstrate that, that the average income of a household in 1955 was higher in real terms than it is at the moment. Five minutes, yeah, I'm nearly there. And uh, so that, that is what has happened. Now, there's, there's a lot of criticism of the capitalist system. And the word capitalist is, is one that was, was coined by, by Marx, uh, the controller. And he, he, he coined it as a term of abuse, really, of, of a system that he disliked, of which he hated, in fact. And it, is, it surprises me that people who, who are supporters of free enterprise continue to use the word capitalist for themselves. <coughs> Why do we call ourselves capitalists? We, we're not capitalists. We, do, we don't want to abuse ourselves. We are free marketeers. We believe in freedom, in liberty. A capitalist is, is, is somebody who's exploiting another class for his own benefit. Well, no. Free marketeers don't do that. Free marketeers say, I want myself to be free and I want you to be free. I want it to work both ways. But we have a way of, of, of flagellating ourselves, which I think is most unfortunate. But the result now is that 
time after time we hear condemnation of the capitalist system which has given rise to this, this disjointed allocation of resources. The 1% we hear own 95% of the world's wealth. Well, it's not even 1%, it's 0.1%. 0.1% of the world's population owns probably 95% of the world's wealth. It is a statistic of that order. But the 0.1% are the bankers of, of Wall Street. They are the, 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 the property moguls of, of, uh, of Manhattan. They are the multi-billionaires who own the, the, the essential wonderful properties in, 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 the, in the Hamptons, and even those who own islands off, off uh, the coast of Georgia. That is where the money has gone. It's gone there as a result of asset inflation. And the inflation figure that you see is by no means indicative of the actual inflation that has taken place. So I want to just warn against, firstly, ourselves, thinking of ourselves as capitalists. We're not capitalists, we're free marketeers. And secondly, it is important to realize that there has been a redistribution of wealth, but it has been as a result of, of sinister forces and not free market forces. The, the central bank doesn't operate according to principles of the free market. It does the very opposite. It is, as I've called it, the equivalent of a, of a Politburo. It's a, it's a financial Politburo. So it's not the free market that has given rise to this misallocation of resources. It's not the free market that, that has essentially eviscerated the, the middle class. That has been done as a result of the theory, the, the, theme, the, the, uh, the, the adoption of Keynes's ideas and of the machinations of, this, of the Federal Reserve. That's, that is a consequence of, of those two forces. Now, I just want to end with two brief quotes. Um, because one may say, well, does the apparent success of, of this experiment in central banking and debt fueled consumption means that the rules discerned by the scholastics and Ludwig von Mises no longer apply? And there are two quotes that, I want to, that I'd like to, to look at. They're quite recent by various commentators. The one is by a commentator by the name of Adam O'Dell. And he, he made this insightful comment. He said, credit, credit in all its forms is essentially a time-traveling money trick. A time-traveling money trick. If you want today's money to be available in the future, you lend. If you want tomorrow's money today, you borrow. The risk involved is offset by interest. So it's a disarmingly simple but very accurate definition of, of the process, which was set in motion by, by the Federal Reserve. And then in his inimitable way, Bill Bonner, with whom some of you may be familiar, had this to say about what has been predicted to be the end of the stock market boom. He says, will there be an end, to, is, is, is the end of the boom imminent? He said, we don't know, but it hardly matters because what we do know is that the end is coming. Booms don't run out of money, they run out of time. And time cannot be cheated, stretched or printed by the Fed. Thank you. Modern. Oh, Modern. Yeah. Uh, okay. Rex, that was in, for me invaluable mm. because I think what you highlight is the distinction between the uh, <coughs> capitalist system and the free enterprise system and it's easy to give the nomenclature some sort of resounding ring and say, oh well, there's something in that and I'm not sure what it is but what you're telling us is there's something of uh, substance there that the capitalist system is principally concerned with the preservation and advancement of assets. And the free market system is concerned with something much broader than that, which is encomp encompasses income as well. And what inflation is designed to do, and Keynes was astute about this, and I think I'd like your comment about this. Keynes, uh, what the, uh, what uh, Keynesian econo economics and inflation is, uh, uh, um, systematic inflation is designed to do, is to dist redistribute wealth from the people who are earning uh, on fixed incomes, that is either pensioners or workers or uh, other people whose supply of income is constant and, hope, and they hope that it will be constant in value too, uh, to the people who are um, concerned about uh, the promotion of their assets. 
Now Keynes himself made the point that one of the ways of counteracting the uh, force of the trade union movement, which was emerging in the 30s and, the, uh, and, and later in consequence of the New Deal, was to gull the workers into the belief that they were getting an increase and at the same time inflation, inflating money uh, to the point where uh, that counteracted the effect of the increase. And so workers believed that they had achieved something, but they had not. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for me, your analysis is absolutely invaluable in pointing out those various distinctions. It's not a question, it's just something I put on the table for any comment that you might inject. I'm not sure if it's necessary. Yes, so well, thank you, Martin. But uh, what you've done is effectively to summarize my thesis. That, that is essentially what I am saying. And uh, there's... No, 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 you, you, you're most welcome, and I'm pleased you did that. I, I think it's useful to have a summary of that sort. It's what you'd call an executive summary, and that's, that, that's very useful. So at least, uh, I, I think you've made a valuable contribution. Y yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Wonderful talk, a lot to think about. Just a, a, a point and a question. You asked us to imagine a pile of one trillion grand notes. Uh, dollar notes. If you cross the border and go into Curio Shop in Zimbabwe, you'll see a pile of trillion dollar notes, which is less than a millimetre thick. <laughs> and that is a result of Robert Mugabe's <laughs> running <laughs> <laughs> um, but The question is, how, if you were Lord of the Universe, how, what would your solution be to money? Would you allow any independent bank to start up and charge whatever interest rate they like? Would that be your solution? Yes, it would be. It would be. Yes. Because the market will determine what the rate should be. Yes. Well, the market always determines. The, the, the market, I mean, one, one of the best definitions that I've heard, not a definition, it's, it's a descriptor of, of what the market is. The market is a price discovery mechanism. That's how it's been described, and it is exactly correct. The market enables people to discover the price. And you, you, don't, you don't know the price, you don't, there's, there's no predetermined price for a thing. It is discovered by the marketplace. So that to me is, is the answer to your question. If the market is, as I believe, a price discovery mechanism, well, of course bankers, avaricious bankers may start off by saying, well, I'm going to charge 100% interest. And if, if that is not uh, forestalled by, by, by laws of usury, um, then they're welcome to do so. The question is, how many takers will there be? There'll be none. There'll be none. And the competition will drive that banker out of business. So eventually, the price discovery mechanism will find the median, will find the right rate of, 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 of interest that there should be. So yes, my answer to your question is an emphatic yes, it should be a free market. Sure. Rex. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Antitrust yeah. in the United States, was that primarily the Federal Reserve uh, bankers or the politicians that brought that in? And was it primarily to limit the power of the smaller banks? I, Martin, I'm, I, I, I'm not familiar with the history of, of antitrust legislation in the United States, but I would suspect that it was done at the initiative of the politicians. Um, and and the, the, the obvious reason for that would be to say, well, we, we don't want to, to, to find um, pernicious monopolies um, taking, taking the place of, of the competitive marketplace. And I, you know, that's, that's a valid consideration. Uh, whether, whether it should be uh, regulated by, by legislation or in another way, I don't know. I know that the American antitrust legislation has become very ineffectual, especially in certain activities. And I mean, I, I heard you talk about the gold market yesterday, and this is a very, very well-documented thesis about the manipulation of gold prices by the futures tra traders on the commodities futures exchange market. You're probably aware of that. And, and various complaints have been leveled, antitrust complaints have been leveled against, against the activities of the bankers, JP Morgan and others, on account of, of those manipulative practices. And if one looks at the graphs, I think the manipulation is obvious for anyone to see. But nothing has ever come of it. Let's so, help here on the, on the history, just to yeah, yeah. Um, The Sherman Act was passed in 1896 in response to the notion that the railways in particular had set up trusts that monopolized uh, the income of the railways and, um, and kept other forms of transport um, in a position of subservient non-competitiveness. Um, it was designed to ensure that the markets were not 
monopolized, and from there the rest is history. Yeah. But the, hence the name. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Very, very on side. Okay, right over this side. I think Arvo's first. Um, Rex, <coughs> I've written a number of times about inequality, and mostly arguing that inequality is the wrong measure to look at and what you need to look Sorry, at. Sorry, would you just repeat that? I said I've written a lot about inequality, yeah, yeah. and um, that inequality really is the, long, the wrong measure to look at, and you should look at the absolute living conditions of the poor, or the number of poor. You know, you need to, it, it doesn't matter to anyone how rich Bill Gates is. Um, what matters is whether you've got enough to eat, or whether you've got a house, or a roof over your head, etc. And then looked at statistics that says, look, the poor have become substantially richer, certainly since the Second World War. Um, and there are substantially fewer poor people since the Second World War. So things are getting progressively better. Uh, so therefore, free market capitalism works. Um, are you suggesting that I should actually reconsider my view on inequality? No. And suggest that the poor would have done even better had it not been for the redistribution of wealth from the poor to the rich by Keynesian economics? Well, I think the answer to the second part of your question is just quite obviously yes. They, they would have been better off, um, but there's, there's an emotional aspect to this as well, and I think it's the emotional aspect that counts mostly with, with Joe Public. And, and that is that there's, there's an innate um, offence that is given by the thought that the chief executive of, of uh, say, J.P. Morgan, um, can earn $150 million a year as a salary, and then on top of that he gets a bonus of another $150 million a year. That doesn't give me any real offence. Doesn't it? <laughs> Don't, well, no, no, well, well either, I, either you, that's, that's fine, that's, that's your view, and I think it's a perfectly legitimate view. I, I think, I think those, those figures are simply excessive. Um, but that's just my, my emotional response, and it's not a, not a, not a rational response. Yours is probably more rational, yours is more rational than mine is. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, uh, criticize you on the basis of rationality. But when you think of <coughs> emotional <coughs> baggage that is being carried by the free market system, um, and the extent to which it has been not merely criticized, but condemned and repudiated, by people in the United States. I mean, now the, 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 the Socialist Party of the United States is becoming increasingly popular. And, and even if the Socialist Party doesn't make any electoral gains of any significance, its policies surely will do. Its policies will do. The Americans have become devotees of a National Health Act. They want to follow the Canadian example. Now, where does this come from? It comes from a sense of, of offense against people who earn huge sums of money disproportionate to, to, to anything that anybody can ever require. I mean, I would think $300 million a year, which translates into whatever, 6 billion rand a year, as an income. As an income. I shudder to think of what the taxes must be on that amount of money. They're very small. <laughs> 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 I'm very good tax lawyers. Good <laughs> 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 way of dealing with it, yeah. Very short question. Who is the 22 billion, uh, trillion, uh, owed to? To the well, you know, it's been, it has been said, uh, and these are the apologists for the system. They said, um, uh, in fact, one of the politicians, and I think it was a, a president or a vice president in the last 15 or 20 years, I forget who it was, um, said, well, d deficits don't matter because we owe it to ourselves. Well, <laughs> that's nonsense. That's arrant nonsense because the first way in which the, the debt is created and, and the, the debt is not necessarily a deficit, but it's equivalent of a deficit. The first way in which it is created is by the issuance by the United States Treasury of what are called Treasury bonds. And a Treasury bond is nothing other than a bond which, uh, which, which has a, a lifespan of 10 or 15 or 20 or sometimes even 50 years. And it's, it's got a coupon rate, the, the, the rate of interest that is, that is charged um, or that, that, that is earned by, by, by the holder of the, of, the, of, the, of the bond over that period of time. Now, the, the party that, must, that is ultimately responsible on that debt is the United States government. It's the issuer of, of, the, of the Federal Reserve uh, bond, uh, of the bond. But here's an interesting thing, and this is, this is in fact, it's a, it's a Ponzi scheme of, of note. It's a merry-go-round. Because the biggest buyer of Federal Reserve notes from time to time is the Federal Reserve, the bank. 
So the bank is buying the debt of the United States and the United States uh, gets charged a rate of interest which is higher than the rate of interest paid by the banks to their, to their depositors and, uh, and, and, the, Fed, and, and the, the, the banks earn a, a glorious free ride at the expense of the taxpayer. So who, who is ultimately responsible? The taxpayer is responsible. That's always the case. The taxpayer is responsible. The taxpayer is responsible to pay the debt, but who is it owed to? Well, it's, it's owed, to it's owed in, the, in the example that I've cited, which, which is quite an egregious example, it is owed to the Federal Reserve, to the banks, to the banks that, that have bought. But, but it's more than that. I mean, the, uh, for, for, for 20 years, the Chinese operated a very clever system, clever for the Chinese and, and beneficial for the Americans. And, and that, was, that was a system called vendor financing. Now, what, what happened was that because of America's enormous appetite for consumption, and because they desired ever more Chinese products, which were being produced at, 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 at lower and lower cost, they were importing vast quantities of Chinese goods. And they were paying for these vast quantities of Chinese goods with dollars. That's, that's, that was the currency. So the Chinese were getting what I call essentially worthless dollars in exchange for their valuable commodities that they're ex ex exporting to the United States. The Chinese then said to themselves, well, we've got to keep this merry-go-round going. We've got to keep this thing going because we've got to help to finance the guy who's buying from us. And that's why it's called vendor finance. And the way in which they finance the party that's buying the United States is by buying Federal Reserve notes. So the, Ch the Chinese, who are now at the moment at the brunt end of, of some of uh, uh, Trump's most pernicious uh, uh, forms of, of, of re retribution, um, have actually been funding the United States. It's been funding the consumption. But not only the Chinese, the Japanese did likewise. The Europeans have done likewise. But the, 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 the biggest creditors in all of this are the Chinese and the Japanese. Now the Chinese have started to unload some of that. And that could be a potential weapon in the hands of the Chinese because they could use that in order, in order to undermine the value of the dollar. I mean, you can imagine if you started to sell. They hold, I think, something like a trillion dollars of, 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 of United States bonds. So, you know, if, if they started to unload that at anything like the rate at which they might be able to do so, they could very easily put Trump in, in a very awkward position. So, yes, they owe it to the Chinese, they owe it to the Japanese. Uh, they manifestly don't owe it to themselves. And, and, and the, the, the party which will ultimately have to carry the can is the next generation. So, so the reason why the system is even more immoral than I've already illustrated is because the current generation of Americans, the current and previous generation, have been living off the future. And in living off the future, they are passing the obligation on to their children and grandchildren. I think it's a, the it's a most insidious system. France and then Francis. Um, thanks for that. Uh, it, was, it was really uh, a very, very good summary of, of the problem. I think what, and I'd like to hear your comments, the importance of the problem is the very uh, advocacy of the policy advocacy of the free market system. Because what has happened in America, as you rightly point out, is that uh, the so-called neoliberal system or the capitalist system, as it's alternatively called, is now demonized for this effect. Mm -hmm. And we must have no illusion that the middle class in America of uh, of, of all countries are actually suffering. Mm -hmm. Actually, it is a fact that in real terms that their income has declined. Yeah. And that ironically means that Keynes's policies, which are socialist policies, are now a weapon in the hands of the very people who are attacking the free market system. Mm -hmm. And that's why it is so important that mm -hmm. I think we should pay more attention to this problem as being almost the central problem. To, uh, from a policy point of view that should be attacked by free marketers. We, we, we're very good on regulation and we're very good on trade and we've got imports and exports and so on and labor laws and all of these things which are valid. But uh, unless we win this battle, I think we, the battle for the free market is going to be lost. I, I think it is an important battle. Uh, I agree with you, Franz. And, uh at the moment, I think it is being lost. 
I think it is being lost. And, and as Bill Bonner said, um, booms don't run out of money. And especially if, if, the, if the central bank, the Federal Reserve, is there to, 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 to advance endless quantities, endless streams of money. There's no, there's no shortage of dollars because the dollar is the, Fed, is, is the world's uh, reserve currency. The United States can continue to live at the expense of the rest of the world, which is what it's been doing for 60 years, 70 years, by, by issuing paper. That's what they do. But uh, there's no, no question at all that, that the system will, 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 will unravel. And as Bill Bonner says, it doesn't run out of money, it runs out of time. And I, I like that idea. I think, I think that it's, okay, it, it's time related. I just wanted to ask you, where did we get the idea of these ideas? that the Federal Reserve Bank in some way prevents, keeps the government under control of the federal government and in some way limits their excesses. I sort of feel Milton Friedman or that guy working at Ayn Rand, she was in Greenspan. Yeah, Greenspan. Well, that's a, that's a good question. What is that the line they, they took? What, well, what well, does Friedman I, feel? I, 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 I don't know where the idea comes from. Uh, but in fact, it's part of the propaganda. And one can see the, the, the value of that kind of propaganda to say, well, the Federal Reserve is independent. They've always emphasized the, the so-called independence of the Federal Reserve. And yet the Federal Reserve has, 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 has proceeded on the, on the coat strings of uh, coattails of, of, of the government. And it is sought, it is sought sanction by way of statutory uh, uh, legitimacy. And it, it seeks official legitimacy, but all the time says, well, we are independent. And the way in which they create this, 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 this myth of independence is, is by saying, well, the, uh, the monetary committee of the Federal Reserve determines the short-term short rate of interest, which is true. That is their dictatorial role, but it's a role that they shouldn't be playing. Nobody should be playing a role like that. We yes. should have no illusion that they, they consult the <coughs> president on a monthly or a weekly basis, regular, regular basis. Oh, I'm sure they do. Yeah, they, they, no, they, no. There's this massive cooperation. Yeah, I'm sure they do. Yeah. I'm sorry, there was one last question. Yeah? Just, sorry, I just wanted to know, are banks currently challenged by cryptocurrencies? And do you see a future I where cryptocurrencies are. might replace all the pounds? I think they are challenged by cryptocurrencies. And, and as Martin said last yesterday, yesterday evening, they are challenged by gold as well. And, and the virtue of Christ, cryptocurrency and, and gold is that it, in, it, it enforces a discipline. That's, that's really the purpose. It enforces a discipline upon the issuance of money. Because you can only issue so much. You can't issue more than, than, than what you have the capacity to do. And America in the past has issued, well, 21 trillion. 21 trillion. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.